Skyrim is the fifth installment of the Elder Scrolls franchise, and it's the best-selling game in the Elder Scrolls history, if you exclude the free mobile games, of course. Unlike most games which deliver the story as a source of absolute truth, the Elder Scrolls series delivers their lore slightly different. Nothing that a player is presented is necessarily true, with limited perspectives and the subjectivity of stories playing a major part in how the information is fed to the player. This leads to a lot of room for players and fans to theorise. Even though the Elder Scrolls lore is so amazingly rich and deep, with hundreds and hundreds of pages of content to be found in the game, there's still so much in the Elder Scrolls series that has little written about. An iceberg is a popular image format consisting of theories and facts, and it's ordered so that the most well-known theories are gathered at the top of the iceberg, and the further down the iceberg you look, the more convoluted the mysteries and theories become. There's an Elder Scrolls conspiracy iceberg that's been circling the web since 2019, and this is what we'll be covering in this video. It has an astounding 553 theories, so buckle yourselves in, we're in for a ride. Don't worry, I think both you and I would not survive if we covered all these points in one video, so I've taken the liberty to filter this iceberg down to just the juiciest of theories and primarily focusing on the Skyrim game. As we go through these theories, I have a health bar displaying how likely I think a theory is to be true, with a full health bar meaning that the theory is 100% true, while an empty bar means it is close to impossible. So now let's take a ride as we explore the iceberg that is Skyrim. The Companions are werewolves. One of the earliest introduced factions in the game are the Companions. This leaderless group of warriors undertake contracts for the people of Skyrim. As you rise through the ranks of the Companions, you come across the Circle, which comprises of the most senior members of the Companions. As the Dragonborn, the player is allowed to join the Circle, but they have to willingly contract Lycanthropy, which gives the ability to transform into a werewolf. Every member of the Circle are werewolves, and this is a closely guarded secret, even from their own members of the Companions. Though curiously, one group of bandits known as the Silverhand know about the Circle being werewolves, and vigorously hunt them down. But how do they know about the Circle being werewolves? And why do they despise werewolves so much? Iskrimor was revered as the Companions' only true leader, and was also considered one of the first human historians, transcribing elvish principles. The Song of Returns is a series of books with each of them being dedicated to a great event or deed done by Isgrimor. The Silver Hands often drop a volume of the Song of Returns, but why would they be carrying around books detailing the history of the leader of the people who they very much despise? I think it's a little bit more than just the cliche of keeping your enemies closer. One theory is that the Silver Hand is actually a group that originated from the Companions, but broke away for some reason. It's possible that the Silver Hand was splintered from the Companions a couple of hundred years ago, when the Companions first began their werewolf endeavours. This could be why they seem intent to retrieve fragments of Isgrimor's battle axe. Unfortunately, the Silver Hand is not fleshed out deep enough for us to fully commit to this theory being true, but a lot of the connections seem to make sense. Fallout and Skyrim are in the same universe. Skyrim's world of Tamriel is a vast environment, as is the Fallout universe of Wasteland. One tiny plant could hold the key that links these two lands being in the same universe. In Fallout 4, a plant known as the Experimental Plant was found by a Brotherhood Field scribe at the mouth of a river. This plant has a suspiciously similar appearance to the Nern Root, which you can find in Skyrim, as well as having the same environmental preference of growing near water. This has led to many theorising the Skyrim and Fallout must be in the same universe as they share the same flora. To further concrete this theory, you may have noticed that the guards in Skyrim will often state, Let me guess, someone stole your sweet roll. What could be the sweet roll that they are talking about? This sweet roll was actually given to you by old Lady Palmer from Fallout 3. This must be the connection, right? We can actually track this reference further back to the first Elder Scrolls game, Arena. 
During character creation, you had to answer a set of moral questions which would then determine which class you were. Since then, Bethesda has made this an inside joke during their games, so this is much more likely to be an easter egg rather than a universe connection. If we go back to the Nernroot connection, Bethesda's Vice President of Public Relations, Pete Hines, commented on this theory, stating that he doesn't think there's any universe in which the world of Fallout which keep in mind was a franchise that Bethesda only acquired in 2007, could coexist with the world of Tamriel. So unfortunately, this theory is a lot more of wishful thinking than truth. The Great Collapse Conspiracies Winterhold is a city we find in Skyrim in a state of devastation, with the once bustling city plunged both into a devastating nightmare and into the Sea of Ghosts, with thousands of citizens perishing. But what could have caused this Great Collapse? Characters within the world of Skyrim speculate the cause of the Great Collapse, with the College of Winterhold members speculating that the eruption of the Red Mountain in Morrowind was the cause of this collapse. However, this eruption happened in the first century of the fourth era in the Elder Scrolls timeline, while the Great Collapse happened 117 years later in the second century of the fourth era. This seems to be quite a long time between a volcanic eruption and a potential later earthquake or tsunami which collapses Winterhold. Outside of the college, many of the locals actually blame the College of Winterhold itself. The people of Skyrim held a level of distrust towards mages and accused the college for being prepared specifically for this event, as the college was left mainly unharmed. Deneth, an archmage of the College of Winterhold, wrote a book on the Great Collapse, where he urges that the college is in no way responsible for the calamity that is the Great Collapse, and the Collapse was actually due to a year of storms that wrecked the coast of Skyrim. It's hard to determine what could be the actual reason for the Great Collapse, so maybe some theories created outside of the world of Skyrim could hold the key. Reddit user MattLink123 has another theory. The free-to-play card video game, The Elder Scrolls Legend, has a trailer scene which shows Winterhold being struck by big green meteors, and it looks like these meteors could pack a punch. Although if we take a closer look at this clip, we can see that Winterhold was already collapsed by this point. YouTuber Psychotrip has a more peculiar theory, a theory that actually you, the last Dragonborn, caused this great collapse. It's theorised that a future self of you interacted with the Eye of Magnus and destroyed Winterhold in the past. This chain of events started when you picked up the Sarthal Amulet with the Sishik Order immediately contacting the Dragonborn. Hold, mage, and listen well. Know that you have set in motion a chain of events that cannot be stopped. Judgment has not been passed, as you had no way of knowing. What chain of events is this referencing to? The mysterious orb, known as the Eye of Magnus, is one of the more obvious answers to this. An interaction with this Eye of Magnus could be inevitable. This could then lead to the destruction of Winterhold. I personally don't think that this theory is true, but if this was true, it would definitely add an extra element to the otherwise rushed feeling that Winterhold gives. A theory that I think is more likely to be true consists of Orgor of Dunlane, who we find as a ball of energy. They become this ball of energy because they've meddled with some sort of dangerous magic. Originally a gifted student at the college, Orgor was overzealous and ended up causing the balance of energy around Winterhold to change, causing a disaster, which is also why we see him as the energy ball that he is today. This could also be supported by the picture found in Volume 1 of the Skyrim Library. Ultimately though, there's no conclusive evidence to sway these theories' powers one way or another, and the plot around Winterhold is so empty that many of these theories could easily fit in. The hero of Kvyach is Shiagorath, just a warning before we jump into this theory, even though this is a Skyrim iceberg, we will be delving quite a bit into the events of the Elder Scrolls previous game, Oblivion. The hero of Kvyach is the protagonist of Oblivion. At the end of the final expansion pack, the hero of Kvyach faces Shiagorath, the Prince of Madness. Kvyach soon learns that Shiagorath is in fact Zhigalag, the powerful Prince of Order. The hero of Kvyach ultimately defeats Zhigalag which in turns breaks a curse on him and releases Shea Gorath, with the hero of Kvach 
seemingly being named the new Shi'agorath. Returning to Skyrim, the Shi'agorath we encounter makes references to Oblivion. You know, I was there for that whole sordid affair. Marvelous time! Butterflies, blood, a fox, a severed head, ho ho ho, and the cheese! To die for. From this dialogue, the butterflies could reference a room made of hundreds of butterflies. The blood could reference the blood of the Daedra Quest. The fox could be a reference to the Grey Fox from the Thieves Guild. And the severed head could reference Matteo Balamont's mother, whose head was severed and placed on display by the Dark Brotherhood. The cheese could also be a reference to an Oblivion quest in which you have to take a wedge of Allroy cheese from the Border Witch Inn and attract rats with it. Yet the most crucial part of this dialogue is the line, I was there for the whole sordid affair. The Oblivion Shiagorath, Zhigalug, could have witnessed these events from afar, but could have not been a direct observer as implied, while the hero Kovach was. So then why does Shiagorath and Skyrim act the same as the one we find in Oblivion? And why do they look very similar? There is a process in the Elder Scrolls known as mantling. Mantling involves an individual taking up a role, or basically stepping up to the mantle, by impersonating another individual until there was no functional difference between the two entities. At the end of the Oblivion questline with Shiagorath, Zhigalak states, This realm is yours. Perhaps you will grow to your station. This could indicate that the hero of Kvatch slowly melted into his new identity of Shiagorath. Some argue that the hero of Kvatch is actually not Shiagorath, with the whole quest in Oblivion being one big prank made by Shiagorath to drive the hero of Kvatch insane. And I wouldn't put it past Shiagorath. Maybe Shigorath pranks everyone even further and creates all the bugs in the Bethesda games. But ultimately, I don't really think that this is likely, as in the Museum of Oddities, which is a museum of odd exhibits in Oblivion, we can find an unusually shaped piece of amber, which the hero of Kvatch can donate to it. This piece of amber seems to resemble Shigorath. If this piece is donated by the player before seemingly becoming Shigorath, the proprietor states that it looks like her lord, Shiagorath. Yet if you donate this amber after the implication that you have become Shiagorath, she states that it looks like you. Others state that the hero of Kvatch was actually a temporary Shiagorath, with each time they mantle Shiagorath and beat Shigalag, they are later taken off the throne when the real Shiagorath returns. This is supported by a Loremasters Archives post on Elder Scrolls Online, with Haskell, the Shiagorath Chamberlain, stating that they themselves mantled Shiagorath during an event in a previous time. Not actually 7,000 steps. The largest mountain in Tamriel, the throat of the world, is a sight to behold. If pilgrims wish to travel to the ancient monastery of High Rothgar, which is near the summit of the throne of the world, they must climb the 7,000 steps which wraps around the entire mountain. 7,000 seems like quite a specific number, doesn't it? So do we think that there are actually 7,000 steps? Executive producer Todd Howard did state that he would count all the steps that lead up to High Rothgar to make sure that it was 7,000. So we should take his fabled word as gospel, right? Firstly, we have to assume that the 7,000 steps actually meant 7,000 stairs along the path as opposed to 7,000 footsteps. But it seems like there's actually less than a thousand visible step-like objects along the pathway. The epic username of user3389 on the gaming stack exchange actually spent their time counting every step on the way to High Rothgar. They ended up counting 732 visible step-like flat objects. But with the steps being quite worn down, there are several large gaps between each flight of stairs. But with 6,268 steps needed to fill into these gaps, this would definitely be close to unlikely. On the other hand, maybe the 7,000 steps actually does mean footsteps, and not stairs. Gaming Stack Exchange user Joe Doverkin can help us here, having done all the complicated maths. An average human can walk the speed of 2,000 steps per mile, which means that 7,000 steps would be 3.5 miles long. With an average human being able to walk 3 miles per hour, this would take 1 hour and 10 minutes of walking. But because this is on an incline, we could round this to about 1 hour and 40 minutes. Joe then walks from High Rothgar to the Bridge of Iverstead in 23 minutes. 
which translates to 7 hours and 40 minutes of in-game time. This means that the steps in High Hrothgar in real time is only about 2,000 steps, while if we use game time, it would be an outrageous 46,000 steps. In addition, Reddit user Count of Tired of Counting, who while in walk mode, walked all the way from the bottom of the snow to the doors of High Hrothgar, counted 1,804 stairs and 2,577 footsteps. Neither of these are actually anywhere close to 7,000. But don't lose your hope in Todd Howard yet. There may still be an answer. An explanation to support why there could actually be 7,000 steps would be that the world of Tamriel is actually on a 1 to 10 scale. So the approximate counting of 700 footsteps could then scale to around 7,000. But I really think it's a blessing in disguise for our PCs that there aren't actually 7,000 stairs in the game. This wraps up what was the sky segment of the iceberg. Now let's put on our fur-lined boots and venture out into the surface of the iceberg. Fort Dawnguard was built for Harkon. Fort Dawnguard serves as the headquarters to the vampire hunters of Dawnguard. It was found abandoned by Isran, the leader of Dawnguard, and was then used as a base of operations. Isran later explains that the fort was initially built by the Jarl of Riften, who used it to contain his son who had contracted vampirism. Lord Harkon is a vampire and the leader of the Volkahar clan, and he mentions that he was once a mighty king who ruled over a vast domain. The Elder Scrolls wiki user, the Akaviri Potentate, suggests that Harkon is actually the Jarl of Ripton's son, as King Harkon is actually not mentioned in any history books anywhere. With such a vast kingdom, you'd assume there'd at least be some books about Harkon being king especially given the amount of writing that is in Skyrim. Potentate goes on further to say that all the characters that the name similar to Harkon were not kings, or they were either from a different era or race. They then theorise that Harkon actually made up the stories, and he tells the last dragonborn to inflate his ego. Potentially, he was inflating Riften to be a vast empire, and he was Jarl of it. Going back to Isran, he explains that the vampire son who was locked in Dawnguard was forced to be put down by the guards. But being a vampire, he could easily have survived this attempt on his life, or he could have managed to escape. Humans were always on Tamriel. Tamriel is made up of many races, with there being 10 playable races in Skyrim. These races can be put into three categories, Beast, Elven, and Human. Most of the races in Tamriel seemingly originated from Atmora, a frozen continent that's located to the far north of Tamriel. One of the most notable events of this was Iskramor and the 500 Companions, who sailed over to Tamriel to avenge their fallen comrades from the First Migration. The human races that are playable in Skyrim are Bretons, Imperials, Nords, and the Red Guards. Reddit user Libairo presented a well-constructed theory stating that the Nords came from Atmora, and Bretons were the descendants of Nord slaves relating to the 500 Companions War. The Imperials were also descendants of human slaves, and the Red Guards actually invaded from a continent to the west of Tamriel. So it doesn't look like the humans could have always been on Tamriel, or even been the first civilization to be on the land. But hold on, is that all? The book, The Children of the Sky, states that the Nords considered themselves to be the children of the sky. They call Skyrim the throat of the world, because that is where the sky exhaled the north wind on the land and formed them. This could be put down to the Nords trying to push their ownership of Skyrim through literature. So let's look a bit further. The children's Anuad states of an old land, like a Pangea of sorts, that split into lands, with the ruined realm in the middle becoming Tamriel. The old NFA which later becomes races like the Elves and the Dwarves, stayed on the continent that is known as Tamriel, while the Wandering NFA were divided into the other three continents, becoming the Nords of Atmora, the Red Guards of Yakuda, and the Saisi of Akavir. This means that human life would have begun on the continent that predated Tamriel, which means the Children of the Sky could also have been correct. If we go back to our discussion around Labaro's theory, you may have picked that we have missed one piece to the puzzle, while both the Nords and the Bretons can be traced back to the migration from Atmora, the Red Guards can be traced back to the Western Yakuta continent, what human race were the Imperials originally from? 
There's actually an extinct race of humans who exist in Skyrim, the Needs. These Needs were enslaved, and with the help of their northern neighbours of the Nords, they helped overthrow their elven masters and later became known as the Imperials. Labaro goes on to theorise that these Needs are actually indigenous to Tamriel and did not migrate like the other human beings, meaning that the Needs would actually have been part of the old Elnafay. Although this could be refuted, with the children's annuad also concluding that eventually, man returned to Tamriel. This means that for a time, man was actually not on Tamriel. But this could also mean that they were previously on Tamriel and are just literally returning. This was quite a convoluted theory, but I think it's a high possibility that while humans could have originated from Tamriel, they were not always on the continent. Tamriel Technological Degeneration Theory the Elder Scrolls timeline is long and extensive, and it can be divided into eras, which vary from 400 to 3000 years in length. The Septim Empire was an empire led by Tiber Septim, which spanned from the late Second Era to the late Third Era. Now the death of the Septim Empire is said to have seemingly caused a decline in technology. The Nords seem to know nothing about their history, and one of the most technologically advanced things we can see from the Nords are just mills. The escapist user Soviet Heavy compares Morrowind to Skyrim and notes that Morrowind has quite an industrial look, but when we get to Skyrim, we are shown a more medieval environment, with armour like plate armour becoming increasingly rare, and simple leathers and chainmails becoming the norm. Some suggest that this is because Tamriel is exhibiting post-apocalyptic traits rather than pre-industrial traits. To back this up, in Daggerfall, when you are caught by the guards, you actually have the right to go to court and argue your case, with this criminal justice system allowing you to reduce your sentence. But when we get to Skyrim, or even Oblivion, if a guard believes that you are guilty, you can be arrested on the spot, with trial seemingly no longer in existence. Reddit user Rosario Desparda refutes this though, drawing us to the fact that one of the original characters we meet, Rogvir, actually had a trial, and was executed for treason and that the guards only arrest you due to your breaking of the law. This means that law is still present within Skyrim, and perhaps trials were still around, but just an unseen act in Skyrim. The changes between the looks in Morrowind and Skyrim could also just be put down to a simple change in art style, and how we have changed to a more Nordic culture that we see in Skyrim. Antichrist theorises that actually technology has been improving, with the main evidence for this being around Dwarven armour. The armour of the Dwemer, a race that disappeared a long time ago, can be discovered by both archaeologists and adventurers in Morrowind and Skyrim. The Dwemer armour in Morrowind has a high value in strength, and while the armour in Skyrim is rare, it's not as useful as an armour, as it can easily be outpaced by other armour, suggesting that there's been advancements in the armour technology. But this Dwemer armour that we can find could actually just be imitations or adaptations of artifacts found, meaning that the Skyrim adaptations or imitations are just worse because their knowledge is lessened. An additional argument for why technology hasn't progressed in Skyrim is that everyone is spending their time and energy researching magic instead of technology. This could be seen in universes such as Harry Potter, where magic is prominent and technology is at a minimum. If a problem is solved relatively early with magic, the further steps into technological advancements would not be followed as there's no more problem to solve. I think that while throughout the Elder Scrolls timeline technological advancement is minimal, I don't think that there's enough evidence that suggests that technology would be regressing, and most of this would just be down to the design choices. Let's hope none of us have frost damage yet, because we're onto the body of the iceberg. The Thalmor did void knights. The Kashyyyks are one of the beast folks of Tamriel. Their appearance and their mechanisms of living are influenced by their observations of the moon. The Great War Book details the stories of two moons, Joan and Jode, disappearing for a two year period known as the Void Knights. When the moons returned, the Thalmor announced that they used previously unknown magics to make the moons return. Because of this, the Kashyyyk credited the Thalmor as their saviours, and in turn, formed a strong alliance with the Thalmor, boosting the advancing Thalmor power against the Empire. 
It's often conspired that the Thalmor predicted that the Void Knights would occur and seized the opportunity. Rather than causing the Void Knights, they knew what would happen, and upon realising how deeply it would affect the Khajiit, took advantage of it. Reddit user Buckney Boss theorises that an event similar to the Void Knights could have already occurred. In the tale of Drazira, High King Wolfharp moved the fullness in the sky, resulting in the Khajiiti warriors becoming Sench. The Sench are born when the moons are full, so perhaps Wolfheart altered the moons so that they were full. The Void Knights could have been similar to this, but rather, instead of making the moons full, they resulted in them disappearing. So what Khajiit are born if both moons have disappeared? The Elder Scrolls Online contains a book, The Tale of Three Moons, in which it states the lanterns of Joan and Jode are coaxed to make their way for the Sky Guardian, the Dark Moon. This can be interpreted as Joan and Jode having gone into an eclipse in order to form the Dark Moon. Coincidentally, this is another point in the iceberg, but I'm only going to briefly speak about this because it's mainly to do with Elder Scrolls Online. This Dark Moon could be a combination of the two eclipsed moons. And when this Dark Moon is visible, a unique breed of Khajiit is born, the Main. The Main are leaders of the Khajiit and are strong fighters. YouTube and Fudge Muppet theorises that Thalmor intentionally planned this. By the time the Void Knights were over and war had begun, their newly allied Khajiit had an army of powerful personnel that are the Main. But how could the Thalmor have changed the moon cycles? Of Jafar, a book found in Daggerfall, details a legend that Jafar weaved a song so beautiful that the very stars moved to its sway. If Jafar's music could affect stars, then why couldn't Wolf's Heart's powerful voice affect the moon? Reddit user King Beron suggests that the Thalmor could have also used sound to modify the moons and produce some sort of sound device to make the moon seemingly disappear. The Inducer suggests a much more curious theory. The Renrinja Krin is a long-standing Khajiiti criminal organisation. The Thalmor and the Renrindra share a similar goal to remove the leader of the Khajiiti, the Main, who they disagree with. So they strike a deal, with the Renrinja assassinating the Main and changing the moons, while the Thalmor protected them. The words of clan mother Anisi says, the Khajiit must be the best climbers, they must climb to set the moons back in their courses. Now this could be interpreted as metaphorical, but what if it was sincere? If the Thalmor hid the moons, wouldn't the Khajiit be able to make them reappear? But maybe the Renridja used Khajiiti magics, which blocked other Khajiit from returning them, with the Thalmor later claiming responsibility for the return of the moons, and the Renridja secret faction flourishing. Skarl Secrets Hermaeus Mora is a Daedric Prince of Knowledge and Memory. He teaches the Dragonborn the second and third words of the Bend Will Shout. The second word he gives freely, but the third word he teaches in exchange for Skarl's wisdom. But why would Mora be so curious to learn the secrets of this religiously different Nordic village? Stormcrack Strider, the elder shaman of Skarl Village, can be asked as to what these secrets are, in which he replies, Ancient lore, handed down from shaman to shaman since the All Maker first gave source time to the skull. How to talk to the wind, how to listen to the earth, these are our secrets. Nothing of power or mastery. So we don't really get that much clarification as to exactly what these secrets could be. It could simply be that Mora, being the prince of knowledge and memory, is just seeking knowledge that is being kept from him. The 16 Accords of Madness records meetings between Shagarath and the other Daedric Princes, with each accord detailing Shagarath pranking the other princes. However, only three of the 16 Order books can be found throughout the Elder Scrolls universe. This could actually be another trick by Shagarath, as only making three would frustrate Mora as he would want to get all 16 to obtain the knowledge of the complete set. 
that this would support the theory that Mora is just intent on gaining as much knowledge as he can. However, Reddit user Restless Khajiit presents a different theory. Mirak, the antagonist of the last DLC of Skyrim, Dragonborn, influences the All Maker Stones, which seem to affect everyone on the Isle of Solstein, except for one village that has managed to place a protective barrier around their residents. You got it. That one village is Skarl. The other people on Solstheim are seemingly not bothered by half of their population gathering around the Allmaker Stones. Yet contrasting this is the citizens of Skull, who are very much aware of the danger of the stones. Potentially, the people of Skull can sense this danger through their listening of the earth, and can know of its source, which is the Morak's temple. So then, in anticipation, they erect a shield to defend themselves. This kind of knowledge, which is harboured in the skull, could potentially be what Hermaeus Mora is in pursuit after. Like a dead ice wraith, it's now time to fall to the bottom of an iceberg. Let's just pretend that that segue made sense. Sovngarde on the Moon Sovngarde is a place of the Nordic afterlife, where proven warriors who have deceased can be found. The sky displays the beauty of the universe, surrounding a peculiar white light. Many fans were wondering as to what this bright light could be, with one asking on the Elder Scrolls lore subreddit. Michael Kirkbride, a former writer and designer who has worked on the lore in Elder Scrolls from Daggerfall to Oblivion, replied, stating that the bright light was in fact Nern. Nern is the planet where Tamriel can be found. It floats on the void of Oblivion and is orbited by the moons of Jod and Joan. This could mean that Sovngarde could actually be on one of these moons. The Nords have a god called Shaw, who they believe created Nern. He is a throne in Sovngarde. It's suggested that his throne is here so that he can overlook his creation, which is Nern. This would make it quite fitting for Sovngarde to be on the moon. However, this may not be entirely correct. The Road to Sovngarde, which is a book found in Elder Scrolls Online, details that Sovngarde lies to the heart of Aetherius. Aetherius is theorised to be the origin of all magic and is a realm much like Oblivion, but if we picture the Elder Scrolls universe like an onion, Aetherius is the layer after Oblivion. So why would Kirkbride heavily indicate the Sovereign Guard was on one of the moons? Reddit user HappyB3 suggests that Kirkbride actually wasn't pinpointing the location of Sovereign Guard, but he was more producing a suggestion or a theory where it could have been. This is because in the original thread that Kirkbride was discussing in, Swordak suggests that Sovngarde could be a shard of Shaw that floated into Aetherius, which aligns more to the text that we find in Elder Scrolls Online. Kirkbride responds to this text saying, it's cool enough to be true. This insinuates that Kirkbride wasn't actually interested in being accurate in the statements that he was making, but rather how cool they sounded. I think the one thing that we can learn from this theory is to take the amazing unlicensed context that Kurt Bride produces with a grain of salt. True Nords are all bandits. If you encounter bandits in Skyrim, you may hear them say, Skyrim belongs to the Nords. But why would they say this? Well, perhaps the bandits are actually the true Nordic people. Reddit user Goliath Prime hypothesizes that the bandits throughout Skyrim are not criminals at all, and are just refugees that have lost everything after the wars that have ravaged Skyrim, and they're attempting to continue their lives again. In fact, these refugees or bandits actually outnumbered the citizens of Skyrim. Quora user Nicholas Thompson estimates that the bandits could even outnumber the citizens by 20 to 1. But we can see in the history of Daggerfall that a census taken in the previous era listed the population to be at over 110,000, so the amount of NPCs displayed in Skyrim cities could most likely be put down to a programming restriction. When the bandits of Skyrim are approached, most of them do not try to attack you or rob you, but they'll just tell you to leave them alone. Surely a bandit would just rob you straight away. The Nordic Pantheon is the main religion of the Nords, but as we observe through Skyrim, the Nords worship the Imperial Pantheon, not the traditional Nordic Pantheon. The bandits of Skyrim, however, still reference that Nordic Pantheon, with them still saying lines about gods, rather than the Imperial heroes that just tell us. Maybe the true Nords were driven out of the city by the Imperial puppet Nords, making the bandits the one true Nords. 
Unfortunately, the bandits are too generic for us to truly know what is at play. Rorikstead Rorikstead is a farming village that's located in the hold of Whiterun, and it's the main supplier of food produce for Whiterun. Rorikstead seems to have quite poor terrain for farming, with rocky ground and outcrops surrounding and within the village. Curiously though, their soil seems to be rich, with Rorikstead claiming not to have had a bad harvest in many years. The citizens of Rorikstead can be questioned as to why their farms are thriving. Juan Manette is one such citizen in Rorikstead, and he used to be a healer for the Imperial Legions. Now let's hold on to this information for later. If Juan is questioned about what the secret to such fertile land could be, he replies with, Secret? What makes you think there's a secret? There are no secrets here, my curious friend. Our prosperity is simply the result of hard work, good fortune, and the blessings of the gods. There are no secrets here, my curious friend. Sounds exactly like something someone would say if they're trying to hide secrets. Juan can later be overheard conversing with the leader of the village, Rorik, with Rorik saying that they've had a lot of luck with their farming, and even wondering if there could possibly be another force at work. So could there be another force? Perhaps another conversation, maybe one that we shouldn't hear, might help lead us in the right direction. If we hide ourselves, we can overhear one of the village children asking Juan to teach her some fire magic, with Juan telling her to keep her voice down and not spread any secrets. It seems that Juan is teaching her magic, and no one in the town can know about it. Looking through the village further, there are some houses that have soul gems, and where Juan lives, we can find an interesting book called The Spirits of Daedra. YouTuber Camelworks outlines this and suggests that people are actually being sacrificed to the Daedra in return for fertile soil. Talking to other members around the town, we can find that Lemkil and Moralki's wives die after they both just had a baby. But remember that Juwan was actually a healer? So why weren't these women saved? Perhaps when Juwan was saying that Rorikstead was blessed, this could be to do with the secretive farmer's pact. Camelworks goes into this theory much deeper and has a few other points to support this, and I suggest that you go check out their Elder Scrolls Detective video revealing Rorikstead's sacrificial soil secrets if you want to find out more about this. Thalma White Souls Experiments Black Souls in Skyrims are those of sentient beings. The Thalma, also known as the Snow Elves, have smaller white souls. But why could this be the case? Many eras ago, the ancient race of the Dwemer forced the Thalma to live underground, and forced them to consume toxic fungi. This rendered the Thalma as blind and potentially could have influenced their souls as well. Reddit user Dover of the North suggests a theory that the Thalma were not a civilized race. An Elder Scrolls Online book, The Guild Memo on Soul Trapping, mentions that black souls are derived from sentient mortals, while white souls are captured from beasts. But this doesn't really explain the experiment side of this point though, does it? Perhaps we need to look a little bit deeper. Another more disturbing theory is that the Dwemer, while forcing the Thalma to live underground, actually use their souls as an energy source. The Dwemer automations are powered by a soul gem, more importantly, a white soul gem. Maybe the Dwemer did not actually want to turn the Thalma blind, but this was a mere side effect for them turning the Thalma into beasts, and then using their souls as power sources for their very own machines. Now let's shout our ice form deep into the depths below the iceberg. Sorry, I've saved my worst ice Skyrim reference to last. Skyrim getting colder. Throughout Skyrim, mammoths and sabercats can be found, which are animals that are found in very cold environments. Nexus Forums user Dokovin uses as part of the evidence that perhaps Skyrim is actually entering an ice age. When going up to the throat of the world, a dragon skeleton can be seen half buried in the snow. This suggests that there's a gradual buildup of snow, and could this relate to Skyrim actually getting colder? The theory is that the Nords of Atmora actually migrated south to Tamriel due to the increasingly cold poles. 
However, this could be refuted by the archaeological find of a recently thawed mammoth, which was killed by the ancient Dwemer arrows, potentially suggesting that Skyrim is actually thawing out and getting warmer instead of colder. Bugjar Inscriptions Now this is probably the most debated theory in all of Skyrim, and possibly the deepest. Throughout Skyrim, we can find five bug jars, and they seem to have pretty much no use other than decoration. Many different fans have come up with their own theories as to what the bug jars could mean. If you rotate the jars and look underneath the lids, there seems to be a different text inscribed into each jar. Some speculated that these inscriptions could just be the initials of the Elder Scrolls developers, with the words initials of DAT, PIG, JWT, MT, and ZWHT being visible. It could also be speculated that this was some form of inside joke by the developers. But the speculations did not end there, with the users of the Skyrim Reddit combining their detective powers and producing an apocalyptic theory that rules all theories. Here's a watered down summary. Scrayton hypothesized that the text underneath the list of the bug jars were actually runes and attempted to translate them using the Elder Fulthark runic script. These translated to give the following message. Giant Ice Sun, Need Horse Lake, Day Need, Need Hail, not sure what the last word there is, Need Human Lake. This seemed like a set of instructions where the Dragonborn was said to ride a horse into a lake, hailing something and a giant beast of ice and sun would be summoned. German archaeologist, who was surprisingly a student of German archaeology, replied to this theory, saying that none of these runes actually looked that similar, and this was more of a hopeful pattern matching rather than a true translation. But let's just ignore that for a minute and take these translations as true. Reddit user Wakata, with the help of others, then progressed this theory further. With each message line, actually being a representation of the city in Skyrim. Giant Eye Sun could represent Winterhold, as is the top of the five cities of the circle, and that could represent the sun. This one is probably the loosest of connections we can make here. Need Horse Lake represents White Run, as the map marker is a symbol of a horse. Day Need could represent Dawn Star, as the dawn is the coming of the day. Need Hail could be a reference to Windhelm, as if the Dragonborn side with the Imperials and attacks Windhelm, they conclude with hailing the Emperor. Need Human Lake could be Morthal, which is similar to Mortal, which represents the mortality that humans have, with waterways also surrounding Morthal. Now all of these five cities connect with a nice circle, and upon connecting these locations with straight lines, a pentagon is obtained. We can connect the middle of these straight lines of a pentagon to form another pentagon, these pentagons also has a location at each of them. Three of them are Dragon Mountains, and one of them is Mazinshaleft, which is an entrance to the Dragon of Fulthurul, and the last one of them, the Tower Stones. It was theorised that you first to go on a killing spree in each of the five cities mentioned. Then you went to kill all the four dragons at the inner pentagons, and penultimately upon activating the Tower Stones, unlocked the final location, the Wainan Stones. Located in the centre of this diagram, the Wainan Stones are a set of stones that are formed in a circle, with a shrine located at the base. This shrine is the place where all five bug jars were to be placed, and the end times would initiate. So why would people perform these actions, nothing would happen? That's because this could actually only be performed on the promised day, which no one knew when it was. Sounds pretty convenient, doesn't it? But this might not be the final song that this theory has sung. YouTuber Camelworks managed to contact a member of Skyrim's development team to speak about this, with level designer Ryan replying to him and saying that the jars were actually the remains of a cut quest, or even just a cut idea, which the designers suggested to implement, but the developers deciding not to implement. But is this just a convenient solution to a past that is now considered too sinister to fully reveal? Well, that brings a more saddening end to the Skyrim iceberg. If you're wanting to look deeper into the Skyrim lore, I suggest YouTubers such as Camelworks and Fudge Muppet, who had many videos covering a lot of the different questions and theories to do with Skyrim. Thanks for making it all the way through the video. Let me know what you thought about all these theories, 
and also let me know what I may have gotten wrong or what else I should cover. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. Hopefully I'll be seeing you guys in another video. Thanks again for watching.